Hey everybody, we're back for another lectionary psalm reflection. Today is Wednesday, February 17, Ash Wednesday. Ash Wednesday. Uh, we're having a service tonight, and if you're watching this today on February 17, then we hope to see you tonight, as long as you feel safe and comfortable coming. But today's psalm is not for Ash Wednesday, it is for the first Sunday in Lent, which is this coming Sunday. So, and we are looking at Psalm 25, verse 1 through 10. So, who is our reader today? I can do it. Okay. I'm glad to. Please read, Stefan, and then we'll, we'll chime in with a few thoughts and comments. Sounds good. Psalm 25 of David. In you, Lord my God, I put my trust. I trust in you. Do not let me be put to shame nor let my enemies triumph over me. No one who hopes in you will ever be put to shame, but shame will come on those who are treacherous without cause. Show me your ways, Lord. Teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth and teach me, for you are God my Savior, and my hope is in you all day long. Remember, Lord, your great mercy and love, for they are from of old. Do not remember the sins of my youth and my rebellious ways. According to your love, remember me, for you, Lord, are good. Good and upright is the Lord, therefore he instructs sinners in his ways. He guides the humble in what is right and teaches them his way. All the ways of the Lord are loving and faithful toward those who keep the demands of his covenant. Thank you, Stephen. Okay, just a few thoughts that I had about Psalm 25, and um, you guys feel free to chime in too. But this is not the first time we've looked at Psalm 25. In fact, lectionary year A, so this would be last year, uh, the lectionary put Psalm 25 sometime in September, I believe, when we, when we looked back. That was in the middle of ordinary time. Hmm. So I always think it's very interesting to notice um, where the psalm falls in the liturgical calendar as we go around, because it obviously different themes are kind of drawn out. And so this is our first, this is our first psalm for a new liturgical season that we're in, Lent. And so we're kind of reading Psalm 25 through our Lent lenses and picking up different themes. So um, we've made mention of this before, but Psalm 25 is an acrostic poem. And if you've heard us talk about that before, then it was an ancient um, poetry method where you would form a poem based on each letter of the Hebrew alphabet. So if you were doing that in English, the first line would start with A, second B, third C, D, E, F, all through the alphabet. So you got to think of this psalm as like it's a carefully crafted prayer poem. That's kind of what's going on here. So it's mm -hmm. not a spontaneous um, kind of outburst of praise or prayer, but it's kind of, it's it's been labored over. Now for us, because we're not reading in the original Hebrew, it comes off as maybe a little disjointed. Mm -hmm. um, and that's one thing I read in the commentaries. It, it, it doesn't have the flow that it would have had in original Hebrew. Um, so that's just one thing to pay attention to. <clears throat> Two major themes of Psalm 25. You ready? Lay them on me. Number one, the psalmist is, being, is asking to be taught by God. Theme number one, the psalmist is asking to be taught by God. And number two, the psalmist is waiting patiently for that teaching, which I think that's interesting that the two themes there are about wanting to be taught, which is obviously this thing behind uh, behind me today. If you're listening to this on the podcast version, then it says, teach me your ways, which uh, is my summary of Psalm 25, the psalmist asking God to teach him or her God's ways, and, and then waiting patiently for that teaching, which picks up on a theme of Lent, 
which is humility, which is surrender, which is um, repentance. And so it's really asking God, as I walk the road of Lent, teach me. Show me how to walk the road of Lent. Show me how to obey you. Show me how to please you. Show me how to love you. Show me how to love others. Um, I thought it's interesting too, this is my last point. The psalmist is not asking for a changing of life's circumstances, but for a changing of the self. Ah, which quite often we want our circumstances to change. But the psalmist here is saying, change me. Change me. And the secret to that is when you are changed, transformed, you see things differently. And so it looks as though your circumstances have changed. They probably haven't, but you've changed. And so you're able to see them, perceive them, and deal with them in a different way. Mm -hmm. All right, guys. Share your wisdom nuggets with us. That's a super humbling insight, Sam. Yeah, great about... opener. Yeah. Kind of um, going back through the things that I've been praying about lately. <laughs> and I kind of need a redo <laughs> based on your insight. Um, so I am reading this psalm today very much on uh, based on... So I have a lot of texts in my mind right now because I have... I'm right now writing a sermon for tonight, for Ash Wednesday, but then also this is Lent 1. Um, and I'm thinking about that sermon too, which is from 2 Corinthians, but the gospel text is um, Mark 1. So it, on um, the, the correlating lectionary texts for this one are Genesis 9, where Noah and his family get out of the boat and they look around and there's a rainbow and there's a covenant. Um, the um, epistle text, which is what I'm preaching from on Sunday, is um, recalling the faithfulness of God to Noah and his family and talking about baptism. And the gospel text is the baptism of Jesus. So um, the connection that the folks who put the um, lectionary together are making is this, this baptism connection. And so I look at this text and I at this psalm and I say, hmm, where's the baptism here? And again, like, you know, when we did this back in September, it's not like baptism jumped out at me. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure other things jumped out at me, but I look at this now and I say, oh yeah, it's all over the place. There's baptism all over here. Um, um, talking about covenant in verse 10. And then um, uh, especially uh, verses six and seven, which say, remember Lord, your great mercy and love for they are from of old. Right? And so I'm thinking covenant. I'm thinking God made promises a long, 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 long time ago. And then verse 7, Do not remember the sins of my youth and my rebellious ways, but according to your love remember me, which is the whole idea of baptism, uh, which is or one of the ideas of bat baptism, which is, um, God, we're going to need you to forgive us. We're going to need you to look past the stuff that we've done and to have our relationship with you based on what you've done and based on your love for us. I think it's kind of interesting that the psalmist is saying, um, do not remember the sins of my youth. Um, I think previously when I had read that, I thought the psalmist is saying, hey, God, see me who I am now, not the young punk that I used to be when I was making all my mistakes. But I think actually, I wonder... If the psalmist is saying, don't remember the sins of my youth, go even further back to when I wasn't even around. Mm -hmm. And back, you know, um, uh, remember uh, from of old, your love is from of old. And so it's not exactly maybe that the psalmist is saying, I made mistakes, I'm better now. He's saying, no, I'm making mistakes. I need you to go all the way back to those covenant promises, to the baptismal vows. Remember when Noah and his family got out of the boat, God? I need you to go back there and to those promises. And then based on that, you can love me. Remember when Jesus came up out of the Jordan River? I need you to go back there, that kind of thing. So baptism, you know, it, it's kind of remarkable how the lectionary just makes all of these different themes pop. Mm. Man, such good insights, guys. That's great. Um, one little word thing is that my translation right out of the, right out of the gate is, to you, O oh Lord, I lift up my soul. And you said something about 
trust. I think. Mm -hmm. what translation. What was your translation again, Stefan? Yeah, in you, Lord, my God, I put my trust. I put my trust. And I've been really thinking about sort of the idea of the soul. Mm. And I mean, there's this great old blues song that's like nobody can, I forget the actual line, something, you know, you can, you can define everything in the world, but nobody really can define the soul. There's a general sort of idea of the song. And I was just thinking of like, in terms of how does this song bring me to prayer? Um, sort of writing off of Sam's point is like how asking ourselves, maybe it's the wrong question, but how are we, how are we as students? Are we sort of the rebellious students that just want to be like, you know, thumb our noses at our teacher and just be like, no, -uh, you're not <laughs> you know, teaching me anything. And, and maybe there's a place for that with our sort of, it's like, you know, the Jacob wrestling with God. Maybe there's a place where we, that, you know, the collision of doubt and faith and the collision of our sinful lives and God's purity and sort of battling that out. Like that's a part of ours, can be a part of our prayer life at certain times. Um, but I found great comfort in verse nine when, when it just, he sort of just puts it out there. He guides the humble and what is right and teaches them his way. Mm. And sort of approaching ourselves as students of God just in a really sort of humble, humble way. And so uh, we were just talking actually before um, recording this about um, like the almost, you know, experiences with the morning mass. And one of the beautiful things that's sort of written into the morning Catholic mass is this phrase, um, say the word and my soul shall be healed. Um, which you, I, I have never found like a direct link to scripture with that. But I love the sentiment of like, sort of, you know, God being the teacher, he's sort of speaking the word of healing into our lives. So then our souls can be healed. And then it's like, to you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. That's sort of the opening line of the psalm. Mm -hmm. So I, I just, uh, yeah, it's, it's sort of like a, um, it's like a sort of a top down mentality of teacher to student but it's also incredibly fluid in the relationship mm. of receiving, of receiving the word from this like mighty teacher. Mm. So, um, yeah, I don't think like an acrostic, but my mind sort of just weaving around with these ideas, but that's sort of where my brain took me. That's great, man. Very cool. I love that. I, I, I just think about, I, I just felt challenged Cameron and what you were saying about, you know, the longer you're a Christian, you start to get filled up with ideas, with thoughts, with arguments, with evidence, with all these things. And, and, and very subtly over time, you can start to think that you know things, which I don't want to, I don't want to devalue that. We do, we do come to know things and, and it's, and it's, it's not so much that we know new things. It's like the things, the basic simple truths of the gospel. I think the real goal is to know them deeper over time. It's like, you don't keep relearning that God is love. You just understand the depths of the love. Mm -hmm. So that's the kind of, that's the kind of learning that happens. There's, there's kind of simple, basic gospel truths that you just keep learning and relearning over and over again. But I wonder if like we can approach the season of Lent as students, uh, humbly asking God to teach us and us approaching the season of Lent and approaching worship, um, ready to learn something new, ready to be taught, ready to be surprised. And maybe we can let go of all that we think we know so that we can learn it again. Mm. I don't know. I just feel challenged by that. I, I like that. Yeah, yeah. that's great. It feels freeing to me. I think there's, um, there's, uh, maybe a philosophy of education. There's a philosophy of learning that is, you know, pretty strictly mental and it's factual and it's memorization. And there are certain people who have certain brains that really work well that way. And I think a lot of, um, the education that I was given, uh, formal education I was given growing up was that kind of education. And, um, I wonder if, the kind of teaching and the kind of learning that's being reflected here in this psalm is has, has more to do with formation, right? 
Um, what are we being made into, not what facts am I able to understand and regurgitate? Mm -hmm. um, which, you know, I, I don't know about you guys, but I, if I think back about the teachers that I loved the most, it's not because they taught me the most stuff, mm -hmm. right? It was something about, something about that person mm -hmm. and the way that they invested in me and made me think about myself differently, my world differently, that I became something of a different person under their authority and their wisdom. And I think, I think the same kind of, that's the kind of teaching. It's a formative teaching, a, a formational teaching. Yeah. I don't know about you, but I've also learned best flat on my face mm. when I've fallen flat out. And it's like, and I always feel like the, the, those teachers are also people who have often fallen flat on their face and are vulnerable in sharing that. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, yeah, it's, it's sort of an experiential learning. Yeah. yeah, I would even say there's a difference between learning something and knowing something. Mm -hmm. And the goal in Christianity is always to know. Mm -hmm. Starts off with learning. You're gonna you're gonna learn some things about God, and we're gonna you're gonna hear those in church, and you're gonna see them in the sacraments, and you're gonna hear them from the pulpit, and you're gonna read them in your Bible. It's a great starting point. Um, but the goal is always to know. To take what you're learning and then to know it. And what you said, Cameron, is the goal is to know it experientially. It's okay if I know. It's okay if you know. It's okay if you know, Cameron. But the people who are in the pews, we want them to know. And that's always the goal. Not that I know, but that you know. And it's and as we're walking towards the cross, I think we all know of a fragment of the cross in our own lives. And that's sort of the unifying thing during Lent. Which is like we can't know the full extent of the pain that that Jesus suffered on behalf of every <laughs> human sin. Like we, there's no way. Um, but we all know we we have a glimpse of it for sure, and we carry it with us. Mm -hmm. And so that that unifying knowledge is is that it takes us to a place of, of just deep reverence for what God did, and also just humility and knowing that every single one of all of our neighbors, all of our brothers and sisters. Are carrying that same cross with them mm -hmm. and that's like a really beautiful profound thing right on i feel like we could talk about that for quite a while because yeah that'll be our lenten conversation probably um, yeah. it's yeah it's almost it's almost hard to talk about it because it's so mysterious and yet so deeply true mm. hard to put words around it but mm. cameron talk to us about psalm 25 musically yeah, so I was hearkening back to my Baltimore days and just wanting to do some like straight ahead gospel music. Um, my first church position was all, you would probably already know this, but it was all gospel or Hank Williams and nothing in between. <laughs> it was like all straight ahead country or like it was basically white country or black gospel because we just had like, it was in this, you know, Baltimore's a 65% a um, African-American town but then our church plant was planted by a Korean in the middle of an old West Virginian mining neighborhood that was established wow. by, by this uh, group of, of workers. And so you have like the old sort of white, you know, all this history of racism in that particular neighborhood. Then you have the, the black flavor of Baltimore City planted by a Korean. <laughs> and so it was all coming together. So what we did every week was like straight ahead, Frank, you know, crazy chord changes, like Kirk Franklin gospel or like four chord, simple, like country music, you know, hymns and stuff. So this uh, setting to you, oh God, I lift up my soul, got me sort of back in the, uh, the gospel frame of mind, um, playing some gospel piano and vocals and stuff. So it was really fun. Very cool. We're looking forward to it. Great, Next week, thank you guys. Thank you. Hope to see you. Um, or hope you were able to experience tonight's worship service. I know I can speak for Stefan and I. Um, Ash Wednesday is one of our favorites. So mm -hmm. me too, me too. And Sam. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just didn't want to assume. <laughs> uh and I don't know if we said this, but um again, this is only if you're watching it today that we're recording. It's also gonna be live. We're, you can watch it live. Oh yeah, yeah. On the website at seven o'clock or you can watch it later because it'll be recorded. You can watch it anytime. And you're allowed to kick off your Lent on days after Ash Wednesday if you are if you would like. You get a pass. All right. God bless everyone. And we'll see you next week. 
See ya. To you, O oh God, I lift up my soul. Lift up my spirit to my Lord. To you, I lift up my soul. Make me to know. Oh.